All right. Um, hi all, I'm Chris Myers. So I'm a solution, a storage architect at Arnet. Um, so today's talk will be on data movement um, as a service. Um, and we're just going to start off with some sections on a bit of background about Arnet. So Arnet's been around since 1989. Um, basically one of the um, founders of bringing the internet into Australia. Um, we have a strong um, vision for a data sharing ecosystem. That's our vision. And the mission is to provide telecommunications, collaboration and services for research and education in Australia. So um, as you can see from the next slide, a lot of familiar institutions here. So these are our, our national community. So all the universities, we also connect um, research facilities, some government agencies and um, schools and MRIs into the infrastructure as well. And they all um, come together on our backbone. We also have an international research community where we're linked to. So Internet2, Canary, which is in Canada, Giant in Europe. So connecting instruments like CERN, SKA, RIANS in New Zealand, SKA in South Africa. Um, so you'll see it's a global reaching network and we collaborate and interact with the other NRANs at all the other countries. Um, so we can, if you have needs for getting data or transferring data or connecting or collaborating with spaces in different parts of the globe within the research community, we can also help out with those areas. Um, so something we normally don't go into too much detail in, but I'll um, do it here with, um, so you get an understanding of um, the data transfer component. So the Australian backbone that we have, that we operate as Arnet. So you can see Perth, Darwin, Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane, all the way up to Cairns, down to Hobart. So Perth to Brisbane is a dual 200 gig backbone. Um, and at the moment we're putting in a triversity connection. So there'll be three different um, backbone connections to each major city over the period of time. So that gives us heaps of bandwidth in between different capitals and reach out into community areas, Cairns, Darwin, Alice Springs, um, out to the MRO outside of Geraldton. Um, so it gives us a lot of bandwidth because um, we'll explain that the network we run is like a white space network. So there's capacity for our researchers and members to burst for significant data transfers between facilities. Same goes internationally. So um, the orange lines in the centre are cable plant that we connect via to get international connectivity into our backbone. So you can see an awful lot going from Sydney up into Seattle and Los Angeles. This is over the Southern Cross Cable Network. We also have connections via JGA into Guam. Making, they're going to be going and connecting up to um, Tokyo as well and um, also via the Indigo cable from Sydney to Perth, Perth to Singapore, and then over AC1, which is from Singapore to London. And these are all 100 gig paths and S, um, Southern Cross cable is a mix of hundreds and forties. Um, so we've got plenty of international capability to burst out into those other international regions. And these are the direct cable plants that we help operate or help um, or connect via. So for, for focus on the data movement, so I'm just gonna move this. Okay, so as we're moving from, as our networks are increasing and our instrumental data is increasing, um, we're slowly moving from, you know, 10 meg, 100 meg, a gig, 100 gig, 100 gig, um, 100, um, one gig to 100 gig. We're slowly moving. We're, we're slowly seeing the data rates having to increase with the types of instruments we're deploying. And with that, we're still wanting reliability, security, ease of use, repeatability. It has to be repeatable. It has to save you time, so not be an effort or not to be a barrier. 
And um, the user cases we always look at well, for science. So we're not looking at um, how to move movies, how to move um, Netflix, the television, that kind of stuff. Where our focus is on how we can move the science data and make that easier and repeatable for you. So one of those methods that we've been looking at is um, SDMZs, which is an architect coming out of ESNet in the US. Um, so that's the um, basically they run the DOE DOE type installations there for the network for them. So the designs with this is a way of majority of corporate firewalls and IDSs have um, issues when we go to transfer large data through them. One, they either don't scale up, so you can't get um, high throughput single flows through them, or they um, they don't really want to open all the ports for you because um, some of the products require quite a lot of ports in and out coming and makes it a less secure environment for their the enterprise component of your institutions and you know so getting some of that pushed through is um difficult so looking at a science team z which is kind of on the side it's still secure still can be made secure still can have purpose built acl and Sorry. philip and adele's son alice's brother died in a farm accident three years ago. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so the design on this is to make the network frictionless so that um, you can you can pass through quickly. You can put different things on the end of it, like DTNs, instruments, visualization environments, HPC systems. Um, uh, so, uh, and then you add on so and DTNs to help transfer the data and manage that backwards and forwards into your purpose-built storage facilities. And also using a thing called Persona, which we'll have a look at a bit later, um, to help monitor that traffic. So that will give you a day-to-day a -day run of how this, how this, how your network connections are performing to other endpoints around Australia or around the globe. Um, all the networks are designed for cut through low latency. So um, instead of buffering all the packets or, um, you know, like say like a home internet connection where you've got a lot more connectivity going into a smaller pipe out where you're buffering and filtering and dropping packets and scaling people's backwards and forwards. These are designed so you can burst up and push out maximum throughput from you to someone else in a repeatable manner. Some examples of this is the time it takes to move data. So you can see the different data rates here on the left and the different data sizes on the right. Um, and you can see with um, sort of large amounts of data, when you're talking 100 terabytes or a petabyte, at you know, 100 megabits and one gigabits, it's taking a significant amount of time to transfer that data, especially even 100 terabytes, like 10 days, three months, um, it's it's start, it's getting unrealistic that th those will be successful, um, that you can maintain it, and that um, they'll be error free. When you're starting to get up into the ten or one hundred gigabits type range, um, you're starting to get more reasonable timelines for transferring significant amounts of data. These are theoretical maximums; you won't reach them, but um, they're um, a guideline for that. So you know, like three point four years versus a day. I'll take the day, right, um, every time. And I won't visibly age from waiting. One of the special things about the RNET network is it's a white space network. So what that means is, um, say we have a 100 gig backbone. So this is a, 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 a look at one of our backbone links. So, so you can see there's plenty of space up here. So that means that the background, the normal everyday operational traffic of the university or of the connected sites you're on doesn't interfere with you being able to burst out, like say this, this, this chunk here that's going up to over 50 gigabits and these other ones around 30. So you can burst up to that without impacting your localized traffic on your network or other people using the network um, and do this regularly. The weird part with um, research data transfers we've seen is that they, quite often they 
start and stop at random times. They have random duration. So depending on how much data you have to move this time depends on how long they go. And they can be quite bursty. So white space networks are very important for bursty networks, which is quite different to how you would design a commodity type network where you're trying to run it at the highest throughput all the time to reduce your cost of that link when you're paying it the 95th percentile. Another element we use are DTN. So these are data transfer nodes, especially designed computers. Um, the information on how to build them and put them together is all available um, on the faster data website or um, we have instructions as well. And we can also supply them if you need. Um, they're designed for single or multi high, high throughput flows. The OSs are tuned for the WAN. When you um, typically install a Unix system or your Mac system or your Windows system, they're tuned for your LAN. So talking on side your local network. As soon as you push data across Australia or across internationally, the performance of those transfers greatly decrease. And any of you that's done um, SC, um, SCPs or R-Syncs or things like that, will notice this when you transfer the data from Melbourne to Sydney or Sydney to Canberra or to Perth to Pawsey. And then if you go to send it to the UK, you'll find the throughput keeps dropping back and back and back. So these systems are designed to optimise the throughput and you can put optimised software on it as well to optimise that throughput over a longer throw. And also designed to integrate with storage, high-speed networking, and you can see here. So that's a one DTN doing 100 gigabits per second push between two locations within the diagram. One of the really interesting elements, and this is something that's really worth looking at if you have a significant site or you're putting in a, a, a significant um, storage element is um, looking at Persona. Persona is an open source tool. Um, you install it at endpoints. And from that, you can regularly test to other endpoints in the network, whether nas locally, nationally, or internationally. Um, you can do end-to-end -end throughput testing, so see how fast you can actually transfer data, and that can set your expectation. So different facilities will have different throughput availabilities through the network, firewall, security, um, just general availability, what they're connected at, whether it's a gig, 100 gig, 10 gig or um, ADSL, you know, this all makes a really big difference. Also test for loss and jitter. Loss over loss over long distance throw, long distance transfers really affects the way that the, the peak performance of that transfer. So it's something really important to look at. Um, loss is, is really, as soon as you get loss, everything drops back down and then takes a while to build up. And if you're getting regular loss, you're permanently dropping and trying to build your traffic back up all again to get to a decent throughput. Um, gives longitudinal graphing, which is important because if you go, hey, I've been transferring for a month now on, I think last Thursday-ish, the network, it stopped being as good, but I don't know what time or was it Thursday or was it Wednesday? You can actually go back to these, this system, look at the graphs and go, hey, on Wednesday, I was getting you know, 25 gig and on Thursday, it dropped down to, you know, two gig. And that was um, at about somewhere between two and five, right? So you can go back and sort of say when something, an issue, an issue you have reserved on the network has occurred that's affecting what you want to do. And that gives the help desk people and the system administrators and the network administrators a time frame to look at changes over that infrastructure. And remember a lot of time these transfers are happening across multiple domains. So it may be nothing's wrong with you, something changed on our net or something changed at the far end that's affected the transfer. So it gives everyone in that, in that path a, a window to look at all their changes to make sure that see what's affected you. Onto the fun stuff. So Globus. Um, so originally developed, it was developed at the University of Chicago and it still is pretty much being sold out of the University of Chicago. Um, it's for um, shared data. It's quite a common um, transfer footprint look. 
um, where you've got um, one source on the left, one source on the right, select the files, transfer them. Um, there's options up here. We'll have a better, bigger look at it in a bit. Um, and you, movement sharing and discovery of data and, and it's high, not just for high performance, for so moving data quickly, but also doing it reliably and securely. And reliably and securely is sometimes more important than the high throughput, right? That you can depend on that occurring the same time every time and safely. So some background information on Globus. Um, you can have um, encryption in transit if you want to. Um, you can do full um, file integrity checking. You can do high availability and redundancy. So you can build clusters of transfer agents. Um, you can encrypt the user files, the, the, the control channel is encrypted. There's web access, um, RESTful APIs. You can um, integrate this into your existing web portals or um, systems. Um, cloud Connect has third-party connectors to cloud services. You can connect it to like Google Drive or AWS, things like that. Um, and then you have, there's, does third-party transfer. So it means that your laptop isn't necessarily you have to be involved in the transfer, which is awesome. So it means you can shut it, take it home and not leave it at your desk. Um, also it has high assurance and that's not high assurance as in it's going to keep running. That's high assurance, as in the authentication periods. It's more security, high assurance leisure. Enforces encryption, increased audit logs, and there is a HIPAA compliant version that you can go to as well. There's lots of people that um, currently use this facility. So this is a snapshot from a little while back. So 30,000 active nodes, 800 petabytes of data moved. 120,000 registered users um, and high performance computers, clouds, tapes, storage. So why a rich ecosystem. And then we're starting to see these orange elements come in um, with a lot more with the automation and workflow engines and things like this being added into the service and our metadata um, search and discovery elements. Okay, Missed the boring stuff in there. So what I thought I might do is actually, if we've got time, show you what it actually does. All right. So can everyone see that screen? Yep. yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. So this is the main Globus front end portal. Um, so I have a canned one of these, but I thought I might try doing one less canned. So if your university or facility is connected to Edugain, which is an extension on the AAF, um, you've integrated into here. So you can literally just type in your details from your institution. And hopefully I put it in wrong, right, which I haven't. Yay. Okay. So you can log in with your institutional ID and account um, um, password and brings you into this. So there's on the left hand side of the different you know, like tabs, which you can do, which are file manager, bookmarks, so you can bookmark sites so you can get back to them, activity, which will show you your activity of um, or, or transfers you've got running or have had running. Um, endpoints, which is which endpoints, and if you manage endpoints, you can go in there and manage them. Um, groups, so you can be part of groups. There's a, a console, which um, is more of a management element. So if you're running endpoints and they're managed, you can go in there and see what's happening on your endpoints at that point in time. Flows, which is new, and this is a work engine. So you can actually build up a scientific workflow from this, which can, integrate, can be multi-stepped. Um, accounts, log out and help. So let's look at um, something basic. So let's go to a, one of my collections. So this is a public test collection. Anyone who's running Globus or a personal client or a desktop or a, or a connect server like this one can join this point and um, test to pull down, pull down data. So this is sort of like a generic set of data that we use quite a, 
a lot of the NRANs use um, to test transfer rates. If I go into here, I can select one of my other servers. And if I go in. go into an empty test directory, which hopefully will be empty, which it is. So easiest way to transfer files is say, I want to move this 500 gig worth of data of large files, and I want to move it to this other server, which could be anywhere, right? Um, I select the files. There's a whole heap of files in here of different sizes. In here, you can choose options. So I can say whether to encrypt the transfer and in, some endpoints will enforce that to so make sure everything is encrypted coming in and out. Um, fail on quotas, synchronize it, um, preserve. I can also schedule it now. So in here, I can say on Friday and repeat it every, you know, synchronize this directory every day at, at two o'clock, right? Things like that. Um, I'm not going to select any of those at this time, and I'm just going to start kick off the transfer. So Chris, can I just uh, clarify on that synchronization thing, you could effectively set that up to sync a directory that's been written to, and then you move it say on, you know, that's been right, written to on a, you set it up on a Monday, it gets written to all, um, all week. And then on the Friday you do, the, it automatically transfers the, the contents. Yep. Yes. Yeah, the only gotcha with it is the auth token. Depending on how the auth set up, you may may get a request to auth. Yeah. So I've submitted a, a job here. So it's gone in. So you can see there's a public test in here, it's setting it up at the moment. So there's 1,875 files, 651 directories, and that'll start transferring that shortly. There's also a full event log. So you can go in here. You can see how it's been how it's been started, and it'll come up with all the different um, as each stage goes through what it's doing. Um, also, a fault log, so you can go there and look at all the faults. Um, if you manage elements, you've got a console you can come into into here. And in here, you can see that it's sending data. And what it, what stage it's up to, and I can click on this green line. And if you're doing lots of different transfers at once, it'll do that, and I'll show you here. So, so far it's moved 164 gig at 2.02 .02 gigabytes. Not that's not gigabits; it's gigabytes per second. Um, so that's roughly 10 gigabits per second at this point in time. That'll vary depending on the files and what it's up to. All right. So that's the Globus demonstration. Um, there's just one other element I wanted to quickly show. So this, uh, can you see this one now? Yep, cool. So yep. this is what Persona looks like. So in this, you can specify what sort of tests you want to run. Um, and these can be if, if these ones are globally public, so they're registered globally with um, Persona, so people can find it and test against it. Um, you can also make them private. So in this, so from my PS1 to PS2, this one's currently PS2. So Persona test one, Persona test two, different servers. If I click on the graphs here, I can see between these two servers, you can see the regular throughput, right? And I'm getting roughly between 20, roughly between, you know, 20 and 25 gigabits per second backwards and forwards in these testing. And the interesting things to look at is you can see the, um, the loss here is zero, right? Which is really good. 
That's what you want. And you can keep seeing it at zero. If any point I get there and the loss jumps up, then that's when I want to be investigating what's going on. And these green ones, you can see a kick up here. Um, you can see there's some lot. It's pretty small, but that, that could be more. If that was more, that's where I want to investigate why that's occurring. And same as the latency. The latency should be consistent. And that's what you should be after. It's more, the more consistent these graphs are, and you can see this is for a week. I could go back and say, oh, let's look at it for a month and they'll churn away and you can see what's been happening over the entire month and you can push back further and go over the last year. So you probably see from when these were created, you can see the consistency. And there's one big spike event here where there was a lot of loss. The latency is relatively consistent and the um, lots, of, lots of very strong pink all in the middle here, which meaning the transfers are relatively consistent between these two machines. If you're getting something that's seesawing up and down, that's where you want to be looking at seeing what's going on in that space. So this is a good tool for, for you to set the expectation of what's going to occur when you're sending backwards and forwards between two sites. And that'll give you an understanding of that over a longer period of time. And it's open source. And if you're doing low speed stuff, you can put a small box in, run it at a gig, and it'll give you a general idea of loss latency, those sorts of things won't give you the max throughput, but it'll give you an understanding over a long period of time of what, what's going on and what's capable and when things have changed or got bad. Right, I'll stop sharing there. And I'm gonna kick over, oh, I'll just go back to this one. Back to this one share so if we go back up to this activity component see the transfers now complete so I go back in here so i've moved 500 gigabytes gigabytes of files 2.48 gigabits was the effective speed so that's the effective speed over the entire transfer so sometimes it's faster sometimes it's slower but you can see that succeeded took three minutes 21 seconds which is not bad Anyone would be pretty happy with that. And some details about the, the transfer and the IDs. But going in the event logs, I can see successfuls and progresses. And if there was errors, I could go into here and they'd show the errors. And typically you'll see things like, like the disk was full at one side or the endpoint went away or some sort of rights issue, but it'll give you some details to be able to work out what's actually gone wrong in that transfer. All right, that's me. I'm gonna kick over to Ryan to do the cloud store part um, thanks, and thanks. I'll answer any questions at the end. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so uh, yeah, Ryan Fraser, um, I'm also from Arnett. I've just lost my background. Uh, so just wait a second, I'm just trying to find the share. Uh, met, wrong one, apologies. Screen one, I'm doing a screen. Uh, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, I've lost all yes. of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so Ryan Fraser at Arnett. Uh, yeah, look, I just wanted to cover off uh, on additional parts uh, um, uh, that to follow up from Chris. Um, so Chris covered off on the uh, the Globus piece. So I think he's uh, he's covered most of the, the work there around the utilization and uh, how um, uh, Microscopy Australia and uh, the ACCS project in particular could utilise uh, the service. Um, what's key to point uh, note is we've um, Arnett has done a deal with Globus to secure a whole of uh, research and education licence for Globus for the sector to use. Um, we're committed to provide sort of level one support. Um, Chris has in, been in, in the process of providing that to the sector and supporting uh, uh, various institutes um, onboarding uh, of, of Globus and utilising that within the sector. Um, we've been able to secure sort of a cap sort of subscription for the whole of uh, all of our customers. Um, we've, in the process, we've established multiple endpoints at multiple universities, um, particularly the, the characterisation commons at scale project has driven a lot of that demand across the sector and that's been really excellent to see. Um, and we've also completed a bunch of security and privacy assessments associated with the service. And as you saw from what Globus, uh, sorry, what Chris 
demonstrated there. It's, it's a very fast, very quick service to utilize. It will consume significant bandwidth to move data. Um, and uh, it's something that we believe it, uh, is, could be very helpful within a laboratory through to desktop, through to high performance computing environment to transfer either complex or large data, uh, data volumes. In addition to, uh, so basically we're running the pilot at this point, we're checking to see whether it is useful for the sector. Um, and we're running that this uh, financial year out till uh, June, 2022. And we're hoping to confirm that it's something that's of use and uh, continue that service into beyond 2022. Uh, we're looking to confirm that in around the March, April timeframe. So um, if you think it's useful, please uh, reach out and tell us your stories on how, how, how it's been helpful. Um, and that will help us ensure that we can continue um, offering it to the sector. Beyond Globus, um, what we also offer uh, at Arnet is a tool called Cloud Store. Um, I suspect major uh, uh, majority on the call here have uh, uh, bumped into um, uh, bumped into Cloud Store at some point in time in their career. Uh, Cloud Store is very much a sync and share sort of platform that's offered to the sector. Uh, it's run by Arnet on Arnet infrastructure here in Australia. And it's very much similar to sort of a Dropbox sort of equivalent, um, but got a more sort of uh, particular take on focusing on supporting our research workflows and the research community here in Australia. Um, I don't need to cover up on this because Chris uh, very much well covered it. Um, so where we see CloudStore, CloudStore is pretty much the data connector um, utilizing the Arnet network and beyond um, and enables people to have their data accessible on um, uh, various uh, 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 pieces of equipment and across uh, the research infrastructure sort of sector here in Australia. Cloud Store is basically storage that's accessible to everyone who anyone who's got can get um, access via the AAF. Um, ultimately, so the Australian Access Federation can log into Cloud Store without um, seeking any sort of approvals or anything like that from their institutes at this point and immediately get access to a terabyte of personal storage within Cloud Store. Um, and there are additional storage um, uh, volumes available to institute, institutes, particularly members of um, Arnet who get an additional 10 terabytes. Um, and you know, we can grow from there. We've got some people up to you know, one and a half petabytes of storage within Cloud Store at this point. Um, it's fast, it's backboned by, the Australian, um, by Arnet, um, and there's domestic local support for that um, through our help desk. Uh, yep, I've already covered all this. <laughs> uh, the Cloud Store nodes are based across Australia over in Melbourne, Canberra, Brisbane and Perth. That provides us with a bit of geological, uh, sorry, geographical uh, spacing of our storage. Um, and ultimately those uh, data, the data centres that host the storage are connected by our net so that we get you know, quick connect to those data centres and quick access to our data. It's important to note that uh, your data in Cloud Store is geographically replicated across at least two zones. So if you're based in Perth like me, your data is replicated over into Mel the next closest site, which is Melbourne at this point. Uh, and there is also a tape backup. So replicate and a backup of your data within Cloud Store. Uh, so Cloud Store is sort of an ecosystem of sort of apps. Um, it provides the web portal that, you know, we'll quickly do a, a brief demonstrator if I've got brief demonstration if we've got the time. Uh, it has mobile uh, phone integration. So you've got an Android and I iOS app. Um, there's sync clients for uh, the various operating systems. And it offers a, a series of different tools there for A, to get data into um, Cloud Store, um, and then also to sort of access, view and edit documents within that environment. Um, it's probably, um, it, for speed and larger, more complicated data sets, uh, we sort of very much advocate for the utilization of or trialing of Globus. Um, Cloud Store is probably, it isn't at that sort of, I suppose, fast tier as what Globus offers, but it does provide various sort of services there for people to move data into this environment. As you can see, look, it's basically a web-based portal. It has a web-based portal, uh, drag and drop based interface, quite simple directory sort of structure, similar to what you would have experienced with OneDrive or um, uh, um, Dropbox in the past. Um, and it has integrated sort of uh, viewers and apps within the environment. There is a sync client that sits on your desktop and can blindly behind the scenes synchronize 
data that's written to disk and synchronize that over to the cloud store drive for which then can be um, shared with your colleagues. Cloud store is a very open collaborative environment. It is secure. The data is secured at rest um, when the data you can encrypt and then um, encrypt in transfer and then it's, it's secured by encryption at rest, um, which means on disk. Um, but ultimately um, it is a open collaborative environment. So there is nothing, you know, um, it's quite easy to share with anyone, but there's also a risk there. So if you've got highly sensitive data, you've got to put policies and procedures in place to ensure that people um, don't naively blindly share with someone because then someone else can blindly naively sort of publicly share that data as well. Um, so we do have people using it for medical sort of uh, related uh, research projects with sensitive data in there, but they have stringent sort of policies and procedures in place for the utilization of, of this tool. Um, so we don't restrict any sort of types of sharing at this point in this environment. Mobile client we've covered, um, and it has a integrated sort of uh, Windows like Office style um, uh, viewer and editor uh, functionality called only Office in there. Um, we'll do a quick demo just shortly after. And for those um, that have more, I suppose, complicated and want to move, uh, would like to tune their, um, their environment for uploading data into CloudStore, we do offer a, a utility called CloudStore Rocket that can be deployed. Uh, it only works on a Windows-based platform. So if you've got LabKit that has a Windows operating system, you could certainly use this. Or alternatively, if you've got a large uh, backlog of data that you're trying to upload, we would certainly advocate for this as a tool to upload data into Cloud Store because it does um, optimize the bandwidth that you've got available to move data. Uh, it is very much a sort of draggy, droppy sort of interface, and it does provide other sort of mechanisms there to share data or larger data sets. You know. Um, within uh, this, who, who, with people who are not members of the AF or nor can get access to Cloud Store, you can share them still through a functionality called File Sender. And this is a highly secure sort of sharing um, functionality, provides encryption and password um, vouchers and stuff like that to be able to share. Um, and it's another tool that's sort of baked in within the Cloud Store environment. And finally, we have a analytics um, environment as well, um, based off Jupyter Notebooks that enables people to basically use the data that got in Cloud Store and for wherever for that matter, um, and uh, utilize either R or uh, Python to create notebooks to analyze that data within this environment. So we have a small compute capacity also backboning um, our Cloud Store uh, environment. And we can cover, there's, as previously discussed, there's an opportunity there to acquire additional storage uh, for the notion of cloud, uh, group drives. Um, and a security and resilience perspective, um, there's a bit of details around some of our security policies and resilience measures that we put in place around Cloud Store. And if you have any questions around this, the best way to get in contact is either ping Chris or myself, or alternatively just uh, email support at Arnet. Um, and through there, your, um, your, your uh, request will be handled uh, uh, very promptly by our service desk and uh, resulting one of our technical people uh, um, getting in contact and helping you out. Um, David, if I've just got a quick time, I'll just quickly show the environment live, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. But yep, yep. Alrighty. Uh, where's it going? Alrighty, so this is Cloud Store, as you can see. Um, I have uh, some menu options over here. I have my folders and files in this sort of environment here. It's very much uh, like a, a file directory, um, file explorer. Um, I've got more files here. I've got about, I think about 400 terabytes of data or something like that um, within this environment. Um, I can just click through and basically I can just, uh, in this environment, I can grab a local file and just drag and drop and copy it over. It says I don't have permission to copy it into that, which is probably right. <laughs> I chose the wrong area. Always the way, isn't it? Um, so I won't put it into there. The problem when you do live demos, you're doing things in a rush and you always miss something. Um, so I'll put this one into here. Um, there, I'll copy that file. And you can see there, bang, it's been uploaded. I'll put it with that warning message. That one's processing, it's uploading, so it's checking. Um, and there you can see the file in that environment. What it also does is has, it keeps track of all your activity within the environment. So it can get activity logs on who you've, where you've uploaded, who's downloaded, who's shared with what, um, and you know, what times and things that they were associated with. 
Um, this is an extensive logs in here and you can then specify activities by you or activities by others. Um, we also have, for those who are um, administrators at institutes, has a extensive tenant portal, which is where people can manage their university or institutes allocations and usage within the environment. Um, has our file sender capability, as well as um, our integrated Jupyter notebook um, side of things. Um, and within the, each of these tools, they all integrate within the cloud store storage device. The final bit is primarily, uh, you can see there's a, uh, this is the desktop app. This is uh, behind the scenes, synchronizing my local drives with uh, my cloud store drive. So my data that's on this, as with like a similar to a OneDrive, um, is you know, on my phone and everywhere else that I need it at this point in time. Um, but it is sort of more tailored towards larger, more complicated sort of data sets and, and constructs of um, folders and um, other environments. Um, that's pretty much it, I think, uh, David. Um, but look, I thank you all for your time. I think there's a couple of uh, additional questions that were in the chat, so we're happy to cover those if um, people have any. Yep, uh, thank you very much, um, Ryan and Chris. Um, lots of information, um, great talk. Uh, so if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, to either drop it in the in the chat or just ask the, the question. If you if you ask the question, it would be great if you also have your video on. Um, I will start with a with a question actually. Um, if uh, if I want to use uh, Persona or Globus, what should I do? Should I send you an email or should I contact my local ITS? So. Um... Both probably. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so Globus, um, we're, we're coordinating that through the majority of the time through the university. So there's a central point of contact because it's um, the authentication is domain based. Um, so we're working it through that way. Um, for Persona, uh, you don't you can just install it on a Unix box if you have one and run it up. I would say talk to your ITS, the IT department about it because um, they may think something odd's going on because I'll start seeing regular bursts of traffic coming out of these boxes. So it's definitely worth having a conversation with them about what you're doing and maybe that they already have one that you could utilize as well or that um, or they may tell you not to do it. <laughs> um, right. But it's is it, is it part of of the toolbox that come when the university, like uh, with the services that they pay to run, is it part of the toolbox that comes uh, by default? Persona does isn't by default. Okay. Um, uh, but certainly welcome for the R and E. So we use it on our backbone, and internationally it's used on the backbones to monitor interconnectivity between the different NRANs and within your own NRAN. Um, we're also using it in the ACCS project um, to monitor the, the connectivity to major sites. Um, so University of Oregon to Monash, but um, if, you, if your eyes were quick, you'd see like we're connecting to the NCI one. So NCI runs one. A lot of the big computer centers run them as well. So you can connect to those and know what's going on to them. Um, one's in the US, so if you're transferring like data from uh, USGS, geosciences over there, then they'll be there. Um, you'll be able to understand what your bandwidth capabilities are to those locations as well. There's hundreds of them around the world that you can connect to and, and choose from. Oh, thanks. And the, the repos are available from the Internet2 website. So just, just I suppose, just also just on the globus part uh david so there's nothing stopping anyone downloading the globus personal connector um that's the unmanaged so if you're just wanting to use a globus endpoint at you know eventually we'll i uh, know roger uh note asked you know whether, whether synchrotron is going to be part of this yes they're in the process of deploying we just haven't got that established yet um but ultimately assuming that you had permission to use their endpoint you could um just deploy a personal endpoint on your own machine download it Assuming you got admin right on your laptop and use and use Globus. If you want the managed service, we're generally going through, yeah, as Chris said, you know, at that institutional level, because ultimately, uh, you know, it's it's their domain that's registered against um, uh, the the managed service, um, and the, the subscription provides all the lovely 
management, tracking and everything like that, whereas the personal one's a little bit more lean in regards to just allowing you to have access and discovery of endpoints. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jay, you have a question? Oh yeah, um, Chris, I hadn't seen the functionality in Globus about scheduling the uh, transfers, which is good to see. I'm assuming if you want to regularly schedule, let's say monthly transfers, uh, both endpoints have got to be activated, right? So given that um, your authentication times out, let's say after, I think I'm massive, it's 11 days, you're gonna to have to re-authenticate all the time still. Is that right? Yeah, you'll still get a re, yeah. my understanding is you'd still get a re-request to register. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. To, to reauthorize that, um, yeah, the, the endpoint, the endpoint yeah. certificate time, yeah. Yep. Uh, about about Globus, because for facilities, um, they can generate heaps of data. Would you recommend using Globus to transfer data from um, to two points within the same university? Or do you think it's a bit overkill? Um, so if the, if the university is embracing Globus as a tool, then sometimes training someone once on a tool is easier. So if they're using it for their WAN and their LAN, you may be not going to get the same performance benefit out of it on the WAN as you would using SCP or SCH or RSync or drag and drop, right? Um, but you, you, you're educating once. So the same, same user experience can be gained whether they're doing it from the local instrument to the local HPC or from the local instrument to the national HPC or something like that. So you could, there's that advantage. The other advantage is that you can make it secure, and, secure and repeatable um, with, um, so if there's an issue, Globus retries. Lots of other products just fail. So if you're halfway through the transfer, you don't necessarily know how far through the transfer you are and things like that. You know, so how many times have us have we FTP'd multiple times, right? Or SCP going, oh, it didn't work, I'll just run it again. I'll just run it again, I'll run it again. Hey, it worked this time, All right? So you, would, so you would recommend maybe FileZilla, Cyberduck, Qt FTP? You could use any of those, right? Yeah. Um, but when you, not for the WAN, right? Because they kind of suffer the same kind of issues, right? Um, so for the, for the big WAN stuff, you're sort of talking about like a Spira, which is a paid product, um, Globus, Pure Grid FTP. Um, there's a whole heap of other products out there as well that you could use. Um, and it, they're all being optimized for WAN and the computers you're using are optimized for WAN. Um, but on your LAN, you could use whatever, you know, FileZilla, FileZilla is quite often um, used and that's fine. Um, it's whatever works, whatever tool best works for your scenario, right? Is what you should use, right? And sometimes the answer to that is what, what tool is the research community most familiar with too is sometimes the right answer as well, right? Yeah. Um, any question, anyone? So oh, I have another one actually. So for cloud store, so between all of different solutions, Dropbox, OneDrive, SharePoint, AWS, why, 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 why would you recommend to use cloud store? Question, David. Um, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, look, I mean, we 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 had a presentation recently at um uh, at. Uh, uh, e-research. Uh, so where we are at the moment with cloud store is that basically cloud store is kind of teetering at the end of its life. Um, so we're looking at the moment at what the next version of cloud store would be or what that offering would be. The current one, it's got probably another 18 to 24 months worth of life in it. Um, so we'll be you know, migrating people over to whatever the new platform will be. Um, but at that point, it very much served and filled a gap in the sector. So Cluster was reintroduced before, so Dropbox and OneDrive was available to everyone on their, you know, on their on their desktop at, at, in the universities. Um, filling that gap, 
that gap's sort of eroded. And now we're sitting there going, okay, well, what is the what is the gap or what's the value that we're trying to offer to the community in this sort of space? Um, and so at the moment you go, well, okay, well, what is it? Okay, well, at the moment, the difference is that basically it's Australian sovereign, it's all hosted, it's owned by, it's it's a trust thing. Okay, so do you trust us or do you trust Microsoft? It's it's your call on that one, really, at the, at the end of the day. The data for cloud store is all stored within Australia and Australian DCs owned and, you know, we don't own DCs, but we own the infrastructure and everything that goes within that. And it's all on, all managed within the RNS sort of framework. That's probably the differentiator at this point in time. That's probably partly eroding by some of the other people that have come into the market. So where we're looking at the moment with the new version is how do we specifically focus on uh, working with specific communities in achieving what they need to do from a data movement, data storage challenge. And the case here, we, this is why we're very interested in, particularly like the ACCS and Microscopy Australia is around, you've got a lot of lab data movement challenges, get data out of the labs into storage, do your compute and stuff like that. How do we ensure our tooling assists that and that process going forward? So we're keen to continue to be involved. We'll be developing horizontals as far as infrastructure and storage and movement tools, but we're very interested in the verticals in regards to how do we, how does microscopy sector use those tools to deliver on, a, on, on, on their research and, and help them deliver their research. So that's kind of where we're going and I know we're on time. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, very interesting. Yeah, because it's, you have to find your, your niche in the market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, oh, is there another question? Yes, Lisa, last question. No, actually, it was just a thumbs up to say I appreciated oh, okay. the, the, the presentation, uh, the honesty about Cloud Store, all of that. I, I guess maybe my observation would be we still find a lot of people who aren't very familiar with Cloud Store or are familiar with Cloud Store as it was when launched, I don't know, when I was a PhD student. So um, at that point, you know, there's there has been some improvement um, and I guess, yeah, trying to work out how we um, help communicate the opportunities and, and, you know, the tools that are available. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And um, thank you, everyone. And let's, thanks, uh, let's thank Ryan and Chris for this very interesting uh, webinar. I think it's very good to know what Arnett does because sometimes the it's a word that you hear, but you don't necessarily know what's behind. Uh, so it's very interesting and hopefully we'll have more talks like that um, next year.